During the Second World War, the Germans deployed Jagdpanzer and Sturmgeschutz with great success against enemy tanks. The Jagdpanzers started off as improvised tank hunters armed with powerful guns mounted on obsolete chassis with poor protection and mediocre mobility. In the final two years of the war, the Wehrmacht sought a better balance between armament and survivability and improved Jagdpanzers began to be issued to the frontline units. The more heavily armored Stugs were doctrinally meant to support infantry operations and not specifically meant for an anti-armor role, unless absolutely necessary in self-defense, mounting only a short-barreled 7.5cm gun. However, in 1942, the first Stugs armed with the 7.5cm L43 and later 48 caliber long guns entered production. The Stugs would maintain their infantry support role, However, it became far more capable to handle enemy armor, on par with most Jagdpanzers. While these armored vehicles assisted the Germans in the struggle against the increasing onslaught of Allied armor, they ultimately could not completely stem the tide. After the war, when the West German army known as the Bundeswehr was reformed in 1955, the decision was made to develop a new generation of Jagdpanzers. As the founding officers of the Bundeswehr had roots within the old Wehrmacht of the Second World War, it is perhaps no surprise that the concepts of Jagdpanzer and Sturmgeschutz were revived in the form of a new tank hunter known as Kanonen Jagdpanzer Ansbes III. Following the end of the Second World War, the German Third Reich was divided into four occupation zones following the Potsdam Conference. The three-month meeting that began in July of 1945 produced an agreement having France, Great Britain, and the United States occupying West Germany and several sectors of the former capital of Berlin, while the Soviet Union occupied East Germany, although severely cut down by land transfers to Poland, and roughly half of Berlin itself. Among several other decisions made by the four occupying powers at the conference's conclusion on August 30th, 1945, the Wehrmacht was dissolved. The Bundesrepublik Deutschland, commonly known as West Germany, was formed on May 23, 1949 from the zones occupied by the Western powers. With the beginning of the Korean War a year later, a large group of ex-Wehrmacht officers met to discuss the formation of a new army to serve and defend West Germany. Eventually, after a failed European defense community which had attempted to put all the European armies under a single overarching command structure, Germany was invited to NATO and joined on the 5th of May 1955. In June of 1955, the West German Federal Ministry of Defense was formed. The military forces under its command and responsibility for the defense of the state were designated as the Bundeswehr, which recruited its first volunteers just five months later. The Bundeswehr had a lot of catching up to do, as they had not designed, built, or operated armored equipment in the past 10 years. To compound the difficulties created by a scarcity of new designs, the Bundeswehr also lacked adequate modern equipment with which to outfit its fledgling new army. An overall lack of military doctrine also left the relatively young West German command hobbled in finding a purpose for the equipment it did have in its arsenal. Initially, it seemed that the Germans more or less looked at their army structure during the Second World War, picked the concepts that worked, and then adjusted those to better fit the period. The Bundeswehr returned to the well-combat-proven Jagdpanzer and Sturmgeschutz concepts as inspiration for a new anti-tank vehicle. The next step was to find a proper chassis that could serve as the base for the new tank hunter. This would come in the form of the small HS Dreiti armored personnel carrier. This vehicle was actually designed and built by the Swiss branch of the weapons manufacturer Hispano Suiza. This company did not have any experience in the design of tracked vehicles and had not even built a working prototype when it amazingly secured the contract. In fact, only a rough design sketch and a wooden scale model had been made when the contract for the acquisition of as many as 10,680 vehicles was signed on the 5th of July, 1956. Talk about rearming in a hurry, not to discount a bit of corruption as well. This decision would inevitably prove ill-fated, 
as the HS Dreiti would show itself to be a faulty design throughout its service, despite numerous attempts at being fixed. When the Jagdpanzer program was initiated in 1957, the planned number of HS Dreitis, which had been already cut down, still seemed to be considerable enough to attempt to build a Jagdpanzer based on it for potential ease of logistics and manufacturing. For this tank destroyer, the main armament selected for use was a 90mm gun. The reasoning behind the original decision for this caliber is unknown, but it is theorized to have been influenced by a French proposal for a 90mm armed Spey Panzerjäger in 1955. This gun offered promising penetration capabilities for an armored vehicle weighing less than 10 tons, which made this early proposal attractive to the German command. With the chassis and armament chosen, the Germans began assembly of the new Kanonenjagdpanzer 1 bis 3. In 1959, a full-scale mild steel prototype and an armored steel prototype were built. It is likely that the mild steel prototype was built first to serve as something of a functioning mock-up before building a more expensive prototype for testing. The armored steel prototype was trialed in either 1959 or 1960. The vehicle was operated by a four-man crew, consisting of the commander in the right rear of the casemate, the gunner in front of him, the loader on the left rear, and the driver in front of the loader. The Kanonen Jagdpanzer 1 bis 3 used a welded structure converted from an HS Dreiti. In essence, the vehicle converted the heightened troop compartment into the fighting compartment. The vehicle was constructed of armored steel plates, with 30 mm frontally and 20 mm on the sides. The bow mounted cannon occupied the middle of the front armored plate, protected by a gun mantlet. The gunner on the front right had two periscopes, while the driver on the left side of the vehicle had three. Of the two, only the driver had the benefit of a hatch. The commander and his commander's cupola were located to the rear of the gunner. The engine was located on the right side at the rear. The entire rear armor behind the engine was bolted onto the main hull. This meant that, during maintenance operations, this entire section could be removed. The Kanonen Jagdpanzer was powered by the Rolls-Royce B81 Akti MK Akti F 8-cylinder, 220 horsepower petrol engine. It was paired with a planetary gearbox with four forward speeds and one in reverse. This gave the tank hunter a top speed of 51 kilometers an hour and an operational range of 270 kilometers. The Kanonen Jagdpanzer used a torsion bar suspension system with five road wheels and three support rollers. The drive sprocket was located at the rear of the suspension and the idler wheel was on the front. The tank destroyer was armed with a 90mm Ditha D915 low-pressure gun. This meant that the gun's power would not come from kinetic energy ammunition, which relies on high velocities to penetrate a target, but on chemical ammunition, such as high-explosive anti-tank shells, which uses jets of copper to penetrate through armor plating. The advantage is that high-penetration ammunition could be fired from very light platforms, as heat ammunition could penetrate up to 320 millimeters of steel and not destroy the vehicle due to recoil or require heavy and bulky equipment. The trade-off for this lightweight was a significant drop in accurate and effective fire at ranges exceeding 1 kilometers. The 90 millimeter gun was aimed through a direct sight telescope on the right side of the weapons platform and the vehicle possessed no proper range finding equipment. However, the Kanonen Jagdpanzer did possess infrared night vision equipment, giving it an operational advantage during nighttime engagements. Aside from the main gun, the vehicle was armed with a hull-top mounted 7.62mm MG1 for the commander and a 7.62mm on the left side of the main gun inside the gun shield. The prototype was tested from 1959 to the spring of 1960 at the Panzer Abwehr Schule Munster otherwise known as the Monster Anti-Tank School, and performed abysmally. The drivetrain was notoriously problematic and was never truly fixed. The fighting compartment, which was only 1.54 meters, or about the size of two refrigerators wide, proved too cramped for the crew to properly operate the gun. 
If the gun was fully swiveled to the right, the driver could not steer the vehicle due to the intrusion of the gun breech into his position. If the gun was swiveled 12 degrees or more to the left, the gunner was trapped by the gun and could not operate it and thus the gun could not be fired. The loader was supposed to act as a radio operator but could not reach the actual radio from his fighting position. Platform stability proved to be an inadequate benefit given the horrendous range and accuracy of the gun. Compounding difficulties and criticisms of the weapon platform also centered around the non-NATO standard ammunition, which unnecessarily complicated logistics. The Kanonen Jagdpanzer 1 bis 3 also did not have crew compartment exhaust fans included, causing an unacceptable buildup of hazardous gases in the fighting compartment. Nor was it equipped overpressure or nuclear, biological, chemical warfare filtration systems. Some parts of the ball mount were also not well enough protected against shrapnel. The most glaring drawback, however, was the main gun placement. Sitting at the very front, a disproportionate amount of weight was placed on the front wheels. The 26% increase in weight caused extreme wear on the bearings of the running gear that subsequently broke during its first trials after just 68 kilometers. While the initial contract requirement for the HS Dreiti was a horsepower to ton ratio of at least 20, the Kanonen Jagdpanzer 1 bis 3 did not meet this requirement and was too slow. With trials completed and the wholly negative review now given, the HS Dreiti based design was completely rejected. But not all was lost. Valuable design insight was gained through the proposal's construction and as a result, a similar but significantly improved overall layout was later reintroduced on the Kanonen Jagdpanzer Fia bis Funf. It could be argued that the Fia bis Funf variant was a scaled up version of the problem plagued 1 bis 3, solving many design shortfalls with better weight distribution, crew layout, and gun placement. In parallel with the development of the 1 bis 3 chassis, an ATGM armed Jagdpanzer based on the Ha S. Dreiti hull design was also made. ATGM systems were highly praised by the Bundeswehr and the development of the Raketen Jagdpanzer began in 1959 with the program producing its first prototype that same year known as the Raketen Jagdpanzer 3 bis 3. Interestingly, one of the two Kanonen Jagdpanzer 1 bis 3 prototypes is believed to have been converted into the Raketen Jagdpanzer. Some theorized that the mild steel one was refit, as its overall structure would have been easier to convert. This converted vehicle remains to this day at the Tank Museum in Munster, where, with the right lighting, you can still see the original location of the 90mm gun mount, which had been welded shut. The fate of the remaining Kanonenjagd Panzer 1 bis 3 has been lost to time, but it seems unlikely that it has survived. This concludes our exploration of the failed Kanonenjagd Panzer 1 bis 3 and its brief testing life. What do you think of this German attempt to revive the Jagdpanzer concept? Was small and light the way to go? Or should they have revived the Sturmmaus? Let us know in the comments section. As always, we appreciate your support, so please like and subscribe to get automatic updates to when new content rolls out. If you'd like to buy us some fuel to keep us rolling, please consider visiting us on Patreon and experience the benefits of becoming a patron or by contributing to us directly via PayPal. Until next time, stay tuned and keep following our updates.